All right. Once again, good morning, good evening, good afternoon, good night. Whatever time of day it is, wherever you are taking this online course, LDSH 5803 Technology and Leaderships, we are in Module 2. Hopefully Module 1 went well for you and the uh, material was useful and interesting. We're still thinking about data communications at some level here because now we're going to talk about the Internet of Things. And the first time I heard this term, I kind of wondered what in the world were they talking about? What, what is the Internet of Things? And when you think about the Internet of Things, what you're actually getting is the interconnectivity of many different devices that have intelligence built into them. And uh, you can just take a look around and you can see that almost everything is becoming connected more and more and more. Automobiles are connected my, at my own home, my refrigerator, my washer dryer, my range top, and uh, multiple other devices around my home, my smart door, my smart garage. I have so many different devices in my home that used to just be machines and are now controllable from my phone. And all of these things are now connected to the Internet. And so the Internet of Things has come about. And this is our second topic. And this is actually a very important topic because while home automation and all of our personal lives are being affected by the Internet of Things, industry is also being affected by the Internet of Things. And as technology leaders, it is incumbent upon us to have a grasp of the different kinds of technologies technologies that are available and be in a position to say, hey, are we using this? Are there advantages that we could take it, uh, that we could uh, use to make our uh, company run more efficiently or to make our factory better or to make um, the different kinds of activities that we've got going on better? And, and that's the question we need to ask. And a lot of Internet of Things devices may actually be very useful to you. The Internet of Things, the de definition is here, the first bullet, it refers to a network of physical devices like vehicles, home appliances that I've already mentioned, other things. And these devices are embedded with sensors that can um, tell things about the outside world around them. It might be the presence of people, might be temperature, might be weather conditions. It could be any one of a number of things, but they have sensors so they can tell what's happening in the physical world around them. And they have software that is processing that information. And typically what they're doing is they are sending that information somewhere. Now, some Internet of Things devices are simply monitoring and actually inter directly interacting and controlling an environment, like maybe your home thermostat. Uh, but more than likely, even your home thermostat is sending that information to some central repository. I know my smart thermostat does. And, um, and then that repository is maintaining that data. Think of the ring doorbell that you might have on your home. It, it can capture video and store it when it captures it. And so it has a sensor, a camera, and a microphone. And when it senses activity, it records it, sends it off to some central location. And I gave the example here that I already mentioned, the washing machine, fridge, and all these things. I have a road bike, a very nice road bike from Trek that I buy, that I ride. It has a... GPS device that it uses for my bike computer, and that is Wi-Fi capable. It connects through my phone, and with that, it reports my, all my ride data and my position, and it actually connects to my wife, and every time I go for a ride, it sends her an email and says, if you wish to track this person's ride, you can, and I'm very happy about that because if I get in an accident or if I get hit by a car, she will be able to know where I am by looking at that data that came from the Internet of Things device that's on my bicycle. Um, so when you begin to you really think about this as a mind-blowing kind of thing, that you can have so many devices that are connected and providing information, and how, how this can revolutionize things like healthcare, agricultural, industrial operations. It's just really the possibilities are endless in terms of what you could do with this. Now, uh, we do have a concern, and that is uh, security and privacy and the ethical use of IoT technology. And we are certainly, as leaders, going to have to be uh, aware of that and taking that into account. The, there are many, many applications, and this hopefully just gives you a list of some of them. I don't know that I'm going to read this list to you. You can take a look at it in your own time. But a few that I would like to highlight, uh, one being healthcare and uh, IoT devices are uh, connected medical equipment. I know that uh, my father not long ago had some heart problems. 
So they put an IoT device on him that monitored his heart for a long period of time, sent the data into the doctor's office where it was processed, and they were able to get a much better picture of how his heart was working on a, as he went through his day rather than just while he was in the doctor's office. And uh, once again, as soon as that happens, we now begin to open up things like uh, what are the HIPAA laws related to that data? How is that data being protected? How is it being used? Who has access to it? Uh, not only did it bring great help to my dad, but also it, uh, you know, potentially, if he was concerned about it, it might expose his health information. Um, IBM, uh, we may talk about this later, but IBM has used AI to try to build, or talk about at least, building smart cities. And uh, in order to do that, you have to have sensors somewhere and those sensors have to be connected and those are IOT devices. If you wanna build a smart building uh, that can be aware of where people are, turn lights on and off, uh, operate uh, environmental controls, all this kind of stuff is enabled by IOT. Um, you know, so, so these are some different areas where IOT can help and as again, we need to be aware of them and certainly aware of the technology. Now, when you have an IoT device, the uh, one of the key components is that built-in sensor or actuator. And uh, you should understand that IoT is based on this. It's based on built-in components. IoT works because of the built-in components. And so what are the differences between those things? A sensor is a device inside your IoT machine that will collect data from the environment, temperature, humidity, light, motion, sound, uh, really, you know, whatever you, uh, whether or not something is close, uh, the velocity of things moving nearby, uh, there's an endless number of sensors that you could put into an IoT device. Actuators are controllers. So a sensor is detecting, you can think of it as input, actuators you can kind of think of as an output device. They are going to control a physical device. They might open or close a lock. They might open or close a garage door. They might raise the temperature in a room or turn the lights on or off, or turn off the water or turn on the water in the case of maybe you know a, a yard sprinkler system. Um, a lot of IoT devices have multiple devices. They have multiple sensors, multiple actuators, and they collect and act on the data in real time. For instance, a smart thermostat can detect the temperature, whether there's someone in the house, the humidity, and all kinds of other environmental conditions. In fact, my smart thermostat at home not only detects that information, but it also learns how good my air conditioner is and under what condition my air can under what conditions my air conditioner works the most efficiently. And it actually has intelligence built in to modify the way in which it turns the air conditioner on and off in order to take advantage of the particular operating characteristics of my air conditioner. So, so again, it's very subtle but very, very powerful way in which we can use IoT. It's up to us as leaders to ensure that the sensors and actuators that are put in IoT systems that we might buy or implement, we need to make sure they're reliable, accurate. We should have an understanding or people that work with us should have an understanding of how they operate and where they will operate. It's also important for us to think about the power consumption of these sensors and actuators. Everything that we're doing when we're detecting or controlling things that requires power and um, these things are usually very small devices, but the question is not so much, oh, we're using so and so many watts of power from the grid, but rather, is this a battery operated device or is this something that's to be plugged in all the time? If it's battery operated, how does it recharge? And so things like that can come into play. We usually think of the internet protocols and internet connectivity, and uh, we just talked about that and some of the basic protocols in the internet are the internet protocol, Wi-Fi, it's not listed here. TCP and UDP are some very, very standard internet protocols. In other words, we think of internet of things and we think, oh, it's going to talk on the internet to some other server. But actually, there are many other kinds of communication methods that we should be aware of. For instance, IoT devices use Bluetooth. And I think we're all pretty familiar with Bluetooth. I'm recording this using a Bluetooth Bose speaker right now. Hopefully the sound quality is very good. <laughs> and, uh, but there are other devices called Zigbee, other communication methods known as Zigbee, Z-Wave. Some devices use cellular networks. I mentioned my bicycle a device uses my phone and in, 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 indirectly the cellular network that my phone is connected to. 
And so there are just the main point is there are other communication protocols and media types that can be used. And so when you're choosing and implementing an IoT device, you have to be thoughtful. What, what power consumption, what radio interference might you be creating or be affected by? Are you in a very noisy environment? And that, that this note here talks about factories. Factories are very electromagnetically noisy environments. And will the communication sensors actually work or is there too much noise in there? Of course, security and uh, whether or not these communication systems can be hacked or uh, broken into is something that we've got to be keeping in the forefront of our mind at all times. Is the device susceptible to intrusion? Is it reliable? You know, several years ago, some hackers uh, demonstrated that they were able to hack into some cars. And uh, of course, you know, that that's a, not only is that a, uh, you know, potential serious theft, but more importantly, if someone can hack into a car and control it, then they can cause great harm to the individuals who are in the car. What are some platforms and architectures? Um, so IoT is a software solution that runs, I'm sorry, Matt, let me back up. We've talked mostly about the devices that we would call at the edge of the internet cloud. They're out there in a user environment or an industrial, industrial environment. But there's usually a central location, a central server that is running software that is actually collecting uh, processing and doing things with this data. And so that's called a platform. The, so the platform is a software solution. It runs in a central location. It could be implemented at an, at, at an internal location to your company or to your school. It could also be implemented in the cloud. And we will have a section on cloud computing later in this course. So the platform provides a set of tools and services that are used for developing and managing these IoT applications. And typically this includes features like device management, data storage, real-time analysis, uh, management of the communication protocols and so on and so forth. IoT platforms, one of the really cool things about the way we can combine IoT platforms with other solutions like cloud solutions, uh, we, can be, we can use those to build and manage solutions across all kinds of different in industries and all kinds of use cases. The flexibility is really quite amazing here. IoT platforms are often used in an event-driven architecture. In other words, the IoT device out there at the edge is monitoring and waiting for a threshold to be crossed. Best example that immediately comes to mind, probably you're already thinking of it, is a home thermostat. It sits there and waits for the house to either get too cold or too warm, and then it turns on the air conditioner or turns on the heater. And that is an event that drove the behavior of the IoT platform. Architectures typically have three layers. You have the device layer, the network layer, and the application layer. And uh, so, and those I think make very intuitive sense. The device layer is going to include the specific IoT devices that are going to be out there collecting data, interacting with the environment. They're going to be the things with sensors and actuators. The network layer is the, the link between the IoT devices and ultimately the platform. And then the application layer is that platform that we just talked about. It includes software applications, analytics tools, and uh, things like that. Understanding that and having a clear idea of that in your mind is critical to you as a technology leader if you're going to be thinking, okay, well, we'll buy these devices, but then we also have to have, it's just not the devices, we have to have the rest of the architecture. We have to have the communication environment and the communication media, and then we also have to have some sort of platform. Now, uh, every, every topic we're going to talk about is going to talk about security and privacy. This is an absolutely critical element, and in fact, we will have a module on, on cybersecurity. There are entire majors now in cybersecurity, so we're certainly not going to be able to get into any kind of really super serious depth here today. Having said that, uh, we are going to talk about it every time we talk about one of these topics. And uh, a lot of times, IoT devices are placed in vulnerable locations. They're placed in a place that's potentially accessible to someone. And so there are times when you think, well, what if we physically secure it, put a box around it? Well, you may get in, prevent it from actually doing its job. You can't put a box around something that's going to take video. Uh, now, maybe you could remove the video camera, but that's the kind of thing that you're thinking about in terms of mitigating the risk. Uh, IoT devices are well-known targets now, and hackers are always looking for ways that they can get into them because of not only can IoT devices be used to control and monitor and gather information, but once someone is able to start beginning run, to begin running programs on an IoT device 
maybe um, viruses or worms that are hidden, uh, oftentimes those devices are behind a firewall. And now a program, ha a, a hacker has a platform to move from. So it's absolutely critical that we are, are very mindful of the kinds of risks and exposures that they have. Of course, privacy is also an issue, and that is a security and ethical concern. Is the IoT device, there are devices, for instance, that are doing facial recognition in lots of different countries around the world. And uh, how is that being used? Is it being used ethically? Is it being, um, are the governmental powers that are using those, are they using them ethically, or are they using them perhaps to uh, stifle dissent? Uh, uh, here in America, we have a great value of free speech, and uh, so we have to think about how is this information being used? One of the things that IoT generates, if you think about, if you think about, an, uh, let's say you're a Fortune 500 corporation and you are deploying IoT devices in all of your offices and all of your um, retail stores, perhaps, well, that's going to generate a ton of data. And so now we're going to be thinking about big data. In fact, you're probably going to get tired of hearing that in the first two or three weeks, but we also have a module on big data and what that means. Big data, the, the quick definition is big data are large complex data sets and usually the data set requires some very um, specific and unique approaches to, to uh, working through, analyzing, getting useful information out of that. So IoT devices generate a high volume of data and they also generate what we call high velocity. And that just means that a lot of data arrives very quickly and that can put tremendous stress on processors that are trying to process that data and respond in real time. A uh, real good example of that that we will look at later is, uh, for instance, the stock market. You might have um, big data processors that are managing and monitoring stock market transactions, and you can just think about how many millions of those are happening all the time. Uh, so when we look at IoT, we're looking at real-time analytics that are going to allow organizations to quickly respond to new conditions or events. And uh, also, we, we look at uh, are we going to monitor this data and can we try to, can we see a trend and predict something and prevent it before it happens? Um, th that's, that's critical. Uh, so big data for IoT may even involve you putting additional processing power into your data, into your data warehouse, into your data center. And again, so now this leads to a, another cost. Is it worth the cost? Those are decisions that you'll we also look at AI and machine learning, and we're going to, we're going to look at that later too. But IoT um, has a direct impact on machine learning. Um, I already talked to you about how my my uh, home thermostat has learned about how my um, air conditioner works, and and it adjusted itself. It now uses a limited form of AI to try to be intelligent about how it uses the air conditioner to cool the house. And it, of course, it senses when I'm there and when I'm not there. So it's also smart about, oh, well, there's no one here, so I don't have to work quite as hard to keep the house cold. And it knows usually when I get home, well, Professor Smith usually gets home at X time. And so I'm going to turn the air conditioner up a little bit when we're 30, 40 minutes before. It does know even how long it takes to cool the house from one temperature to another. And so it knows how far ahead of time it has to start cooling the house. The, the endless, the possibilities here are really fantastic, but uh, they're also in some ways kind of creepy because you think, well, um, where's this going to end? All right. Now we come to the idea of edge computing and IoT. And, and uh, my first reaction to this is quite frankly, well, of course, you know, every IoT device has a processor. It's running some software. Of course, there's some edge computing going on. But this is talking about something just a little bit different than that. What we're really talking about here with this edge computing is instead of just sending the data back to a central warehouse where high-end processors are accumulating it and looking through it and thinking about it, we could actually have our IoT devices process the data at the edge of the network as it's being acquired in the device itself. And then we will be sending back essentially interpretive results from that data. That's very different from just sending raw data. If we distribute that processing out to all the IoT devices, then one of the things we can do is we can really offload the central processors. We can also offload the network in between because 
if we are processing the data and only sending back, for instance, we maybe we're looking for exception events rather than every event. And instead of, instead of sending every uh, sensor that we take every second, uh, we only send back certain significant ones that cross a certain threshold or uh, show us certain trends. And so what we're also doing if we do that is we are cutting down on the amount of data that's going across our network, which ultimately can reduce our network cost as well. So edge computing is a very important concept. And what it refers to is doing the processing of the IoT device at the edge on the device and not just, not just having kind of a dumb device that collects data and transmits it, but collects it, processes it, and sends processing results back to the platform at the core. Uh, I already referred to this earlier. Smart IBM uh, began to advertise this idea that we could build smarter cities. And a lot of companies are trying to enable smart cities, not just IBM. It's just that IBM has been better at marketing it, talking about it publicly. Um, this is a result of com combining artificial intelligence and IoT devices. And so IoT devices are going to make this possible by uh, creating efficient resource management. Uh, they're able to learn in a way how the city's, what the city's daily trends are, what the city's daily um, requirements for resources are, such as water or electricity, or when, when the waste is moving through the system at a higher level. Uh, all these things allow the smart sensors and smart controllers around the city to begin to allocate and plan for the management of all of the resources required in a city. Um, I, I love the idea that we might be able to have better traffic flow and uh, reduced uh, traffic congestion. I live in the Oklahoma City area. It's really not that bad here, but I used to live in Dallas and in Houston, and there it was terrible. Anything you could do with IoT devices to monitor and manage traffic, sign me up. I'm on board. And of course, it could also be used for public safety, such as detecting to emergencies or crimes. Now, here we get into some interesting ethical issues as well. And that kind of refers back to what I talked about earlier. Is it ethical for police organizations to put sensors out on the street to monitor um, behavior? And, uh, and at what level is that okay? There are already smart stoplights that will take your picture uh, and turn you in if you run a red light. Um, most people seem to accept that okay. But what about cameras on every street so that they can go back in time and um, when a crime has been committed, look to see who was there and where that car went and track it because they have cameras everywhere. Is that ethical? Do you support that? Uh, it seems like it'd be great to catch the bad guys, but what if that system's abused? Uh, so these are some interesting questions that come about through smart cities. Uh, so the kinds of things that happen in smart cities that IoT enables, and it's not just smart cities, it's it's smart businesses, it's smart campuses, things like that. So don't limit yourself, just don't say, well, I'm not going to work for a city or a, a government or civil organization. Well, you might be working for someone who has a large campus, and you might want to have a smart campus, and uh, IoT can enable that. So the kinds of things that you get are the environmental monitoring, um, infrastructure maintenance. Uh, there are devices that can actually wash to see uh, look for certain kind of characteristics of behavior or responses to um, stress and use, and then they can predict, oh, this this thing's about to fail, so we need to get somebody over here and deal with it. Uh, what you typically have to have if you're going to have a smart city or a smart campus is you have to have IoT sensors and devices. You have to have data analytics. Cloud computing is going to be part of it, and the communication networks to tie all this stuff together. And then on top of it, you're going to have to think about the ethical considerations of what you do, the network infrastructure, and the privacy and security. Um, summary, if you think about it, IoT can actually be something that can make a big change, a positive change in the technology for an organization. But if it's implemented poorly, it will actually it could potentially do harm. Properly, it will allow you to see, learn about how your customers behave, make predictive um, decisions, uh, control your environments, reduce your costs. There's just so many different ways that it can help you. Keep in mind, it's not cheap. You have to have a lot of different devices and uh, it comes with a wide range of security concerns that you're gonna have to think about. All right, well, that is it for this, this particular lecture. Thank you for hanging in there with me today. 
and uh, go off and do homework too. There are some interesting videos that I've posted and a couple of articles and white papers about IoT. I would like you to take a look at those. The homework, uh, which you now have done the first homework, so you have a feel for what that homework's gonna look like. The homework for IoT is very similar to the homework for data communications. It is due on the second Monday of the course, or another way, it is due on the Monday of the second week of the course. Now in 2023, I believe that it's gonna be March 13th, and it's due at 11.59 p.m. And don't forget, if you turn it in 48 hours early, and that would be Saturday by 11.59 p.m., you're gonna get those bonus points, and those can really add up. Have a great day, morning, evening, or night, whatever you're having. Good luck on the homework. Reach out and let me know if you're having problems.